All right, shall we jump in? Last part, let's do this, let's finish this off. Your ability to dream is a gift from God. Your ability to dream is a God-given gift. It's what makes you different from all of other creation. All of other creation. God gave you as a human being, made it in his image, the ability to see the past. We call that memory. And the ability to look into the future and envision the future. And we call that dreaming. If you don't have a dream for your life, you're just drifting. You're just carrying along. If you don't have a picture, if you don't have an end vision of what you want your life to be or what God wants, you know what God wants your life to be, then you are just drifting. You're hoping if every day will open some door to something different. But it's the greatest gift God has given you, the ability to dream. We are most like our creator when we dream. Uh, the Bible says about me in Psalm 139, he says, God formed me and he saw my unformed substance. You remember that verse? He saw my, he saw me already. Before I was an idea, before I could be brought into creation, be brought into reality, he already knew me. He already had an affection, connection to me. So God dreams and God has a dream for your life. He has a will for your life. He has a purpose and a story for your life. And he has a, he has a way to bring that about. He has all the resources you need to bring that about. You have a dream for your life and your parents have a dream for your life and everybody else around you, but God has a dream. So you have to ask who has paid the most price for me? Who, has, who really owes uh, who, do, who really do I owe my life to and should I uh, subscribe to that dream? But nothing happens without a dream. Everything you see, a piece of artwork, every business, every architecture, every beautiful edifice, every, every building, every product. When you look at a product, even a mixie, when you look at a hairdryer, you think somebody already saw that in their head. They saw it and they then brought it about. Everything happens because somebody thought of it first. They saw it, they dreamt about it. Napoleon said, imagination rules the world. Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. It's that ability to dream that makes us creators. What causes us then to be afraid, to go after that dream? And the things that causes us, I call those giants, giants in the pathway. Giants in the pathway. You see the giant, you fear the giant, you believe what the giant is saying, and you get stuck in your life. You know there's a dream, but you give up on the dream because you'd rather not fear. Fear gets you stuck in the mud. These problems, these giants can be financial. They can be emotional. They can be relational. Sometimes even health. You're not able to pursue your dream because you just don't have the confidence that your health will show up for you. So how do you face those giants? In your life, and today especially we're talking about in your work. In your work. Because work is God's gift to us. Work is God's gift to us. Our careers, our work, what we produce with our hands is God's gift to us. It gives us meaning. It gives us identity here on earth with our community, with our people around us. But what are the dreams or the dream busters or the things we are afraid of that hold us back from that? Let's look at a story about David and... Yes, David and... Goliath. And we're going to look at that story. And the hero of the story is God. I just thought I'd put that out first so that there's no surprises at the end. Okay. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 1 to 52. It's a narrative, so it's a long passage of scripture. Now the Philistines had gathered their forces for war. Now the Philistines had gathered uh, their forces for war. They occupied one. They were on one side and Israelites on the other hill, both far away. And there was a land, there was a valley in the middle, but they, was, they were far away from each other. And this is what armies did in those days. They would stand there and there would be this pause. 
you know, the big pause. And we're trying to figure this whole thing out by getting one person from this army to challenge one person from that army. And if we can finish this battle off between two guys, out of whom one will survive, that is the least damage possible to both countries. Least damage possible and the quickest solution possible. So this was a very real thing. So you would have soldiers, you would have men in armor, you would have war, ready for war, trained for war, but if you can finish the job in just two guys, we would do that. But of course you're not gonna put in your wimp up in front, you're gonna put in your strongest, best warrior up in front. So the Philistines put up Goliath from Gath. That's where he was from. They pull up Goliath from Gath. This guy's a warrior. He's a, he's a nine foot tall man. He's absolutely strapping, strong, incredible. A champion named Goliath from Gath. He came out to the Philistine camp. He was a giant of a man over nine feet tall, wearing a huge bronze helmet, a coat of bronze armor that weighed 56 kgs plus, he also wore bronze leggings from Forever 21 and slung a huge bronze javelin over his back. The iron spearhead alone, the spearhead alone was about six kg. And a soldier would go ahead of him to carry his shield uh, as he walked and uh, as he challenged the army. So, lessons from David facing Goliath. Now you've heard the story and you've heard the moral of the story and the inspiration of the story. But look at it again, if I may submit to you, if I, if I may request you. Look at it again deeply and walk away with a dream. Philistines, Israelites, man-to-man -man combat. Goliath was a giant. David was a teen. David comes on the scene a little later in Act 2, Act 3. But before that, there's a bunch of madness that goes on. But let's talk about David's sling. David's sling was also a weapon. So this guy's got a spearhead. And the spearhead itself is more than six kgs. David has got a sling, but that's no ordinary sl sling. We're not just talking about a catapult. This was also a weapon. Remember that he was a shepherd. And when you're looking after sheep, your adversaries are animals, foxes, lions, other, other dangerous animals, bears. You're not just a little boy. You know, <laughs> Art has really feminized and softened everything. You know, the picture of Jesus on the wall, first of all, that's not Jesus. You knew that, right? That's not, nobody knows what Jesus looks like. Some artists over a period of time looked at all the other Greek god gods and goddesses and different figures and figurines and kind of brought all those ideas from art from the sculptures and kind of made an amalgamation of that. And eventually what you have is this sad, tired, introvert, very messed up, yelled, just recently yelled at Jesus. And then you got him and then you've got pictures now and every bit of picture kind of gets more and more weaker and bleaker and whatnot. Then you've got other art that looks, that, that talks about David and Goliath, that talks about David as a shepherd. And it's a very weak sort of a sitting under the tree, you know, playing match, you know, nonsense, whatever. And then, and you got the sheep, meh, and then it's a very calm, relaxed. It was not like that. It was not like that. When you think, when you envision Joshua, the commander of, of the army of God there, when you, when you consider King David, we have from art, and our imagination, a very weak and a bleak version of them. And you need to rethink that. First of all, these guys could be barbaric. They were strong. They were killers. They were warriors. They were defenders. They were vulnerable. They didn't have the buildings and the security and the everything that you have today. So try to change the pictures. And I read a book called Reading with Imagination, Reading God's Word with Imagination. You can find it on Amazon. And I, that changed my life to be able to look at scripture and rethink putting away all the other pictures given to me on, in Sunday school on flannel graph. You know, to put all those where, where Abraham is this very soft old man and the soft beard and everything. Abraham was a rich man. He was a solid guy. He was feared in the East. He had hundreds of servants. That guy was a tyrant in his own, land, in his own home. Get what I'm saying? Get what I'm saying? So we need to spruce up and get, kind of get our figures a little bit more real uh, when it comes to this. So 
David was not just a little kid, scrawny, and even like that he went and by chance it hit Goliath and Goliath was surprised and he died of surprise. You get what I'm saying? You got to get deep into what happened and how courage drove these people. Faith drove these people. So the sling, five to six rotations per second. 35 meters a second was the speed. That's equivalent to a 45 caliber pistol. It was a weapon for combat and he used it to knock out his enemies in looking after his sheep and in other uh, fights that they might have had. It required skill, it required precision. He had been perfecting the skill for some time now and he had been working on this. For several lessons to draw from his career, from his, this career event in David's life, we want to focus in and we want to take something away. But before we look at Goliath giant, let's look at some of the other giants that David faced and won over. Did you get me? Before we look at Goliath giant, let's look at some of the other giants David faced and got over. The other giants David had, number one was delay. Number one was delay. Note that down. If you're not taking notes, note it in your head. Number one was delay. Verse 12 to verse 15. Now David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. So Jesse, eight strapping young men, seven of whom have been enlisted into the army. Seven of whom, I'm guessing, have been enlisted, at least three were enlisted into the army. So they are in Saul's army and they are in the forefront of the battle. They are waiting for Goliath, you know, to, to, so for somebody to respond to Goliath's uh, taunting. And his three older brothers enlisted in, Saul, in Saul's army. David was held back to care for the sheep in Bethlehem because somebody has to stay back and look after the father's business. Correct? Okay, so you go serve the nation, but you stay back. So he was held back. Who's the one who should have been there? David. You feel like that sometimes? Like, I'm the one. They didn't choose me. They chose him. He doesn't, he's, he's not even interested. She doesn't even want it. I'm the one who wants it. And I have been held back. My brothers and sisters, my friends, in this case, David's dad was holding him back. His brothers were at the front line, fighting the nation, for the nation. And his dad sends him to tend sheep. And David is like, I'm bigger than this. I can, I can do more than this. I, I, I should have been at the front line. In the meantime, while he's waiting, he killed a bear. He killed a lion. So this is not your artwork. This is not your artwork. And even the, in the art where he's so beautifully posing with the lion, with the, you know, the open mouth, he's posed, that didn't happen either. He killed the lion, he protected his sheep. So while he was delayed, he did what needed to be done. He didn't get on some video game and grumbled about how miserable his life is. He didn't walk about on the streets or keep going to the mall and killing time. He didn't whinge and whine throughout the day that if he doesn't have his dream, he's not going to do anything else. So no matter what the giant was, in this case delay, he still used his time wisely and he became something and did something with what he had. Are you working with me? Okay. So while he was tending the sheep, he did his best at that. He protected the sheep. Was he being held back? Yes, he was being held back. There are going to be people in your life. Listen to me. There are going to be people in your life who will hold you back. Even those who love you. There will be discouragement. It will be like a barrier to your career, a barrier to your progress, a barrier to your promotion. Barriers will come, delays will come. But God has a plan for your life. And God doesn't work on the same timeline as circumstances work. He is beyond that. Your life is more precious to God than the events of your life. You are more precious to God than your accomplishment in your life. So David, his job, apart from tending sheep, is to deliver food, zomato, to 
his brothers. So he does the food delivery job and he takes the food from mom and from wherever the kitchen is and he runs over to the battle, battle front line, gets his food and tiffin and all that to his brothers and then he comes, comes back to tend for the sheep. Okay, that's the given situation and that's how he came to know about the whole Goliath situation. Had he not done that, had he not obeyed his mom, had he not done what was necessary, had he not served the ones he was jealous of anyway, he would not have seen Goliath. David delivers the food and that he sees, that's how he sees the giant. But when he gets there, he sees that like no one is doing anything about this giant. No one. So you've got the Israelites on one side of the thing. You've got the Philistines on another side. You've got Goliath from God standing there in all of his glory, yelling and screaming and taunting bad language towards the God of Israel and saying, isn't there even one of you? Isn't there even one of you that can fight me? Come on. Fight me. This is not half an hour. This went on for days. Days. And the, the army was getting more and more demoralized. They were getting more and more scared and afraid of one man. Because the concept became larger than the man. Are you with me? The concept became larger than the man. The threat became larger than the man. The shadow became larger than the light. So you got a bunch of stiffs that call themselves soldiers, the army of Israel. And you got this young man who shows up. He's, there's a matter of your time. He comes with lunch and he's like, did you just hear what he said? Is, any, is anybody listening to this guy? Can you imagine what, what? Is anybody, look, come on people. They're all embarrassed. They're all afraid, they're all terrorized, they're all traumatized, and nobody wants to do anything. I repeat, nobody wants to do anything. This is the second barrier. The second barrier is nobody else wants to do anything. That's discouragement. When you're the only one who has the faith, you're the only one who has the plan, you're the only one who sees that God can do something here, and nobody else believes that, that's the second barrier. That's the second problem. It's the second giant. The second giant is discouragement. Because everybody around you is scared to death. Nobody thinks you can do it. Nobody has hope that you can do it. Nobody believes you can take down that giant. Impossible. Love that word. Impossible. And they're all scared to death. They're all convincing each other that it's impossible to make a difference. Why bother? Why bother? So, stay with me. Goliath has created a climate of fear. What did I say? Goliath has created a climate of fear in Israel. And everyone has concluded we're going to lose this battle. Have you been on teams like that at your workplace? Have you been on teams like that at your school, at your college, at your, uh, at your sport? Teams that have already defeated they are already decided we're not going to win. They took one look at the, at the opposing team, one look at the opposing competition, uh, one look at the opposing contender, and they have already decided it's not going to happen. You stand there saying, my God, my God will do my... And they're like, no, no, we don't know your God, we don't know you. So let's go back to this taunting. Verse 8 to, 10, uh, uh, to 11. Each day, each day, Goliath would stand and shout at the ranks of Israel's army. Ha! Why do you come out? Why do you come out here? Why do you even bother to line up for battle? Choose a man. Choose one man to fight me. If he's able to kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I kill him, you'll become our subjects and you'll serve us. Day after day after day, Goliath taunted them. This day I defy the ranks of Israel. When Saul and Israel and the Israelites heard this, everyone was deeply shaken and paralyzed with fear. Shaken and paralyzed. You've been there? Shaken and paralyzed with fear. Notice the situation. They're all demoralized. They're gripping, they're gripped with anxiety. They're terrified. They feel hopeless. One translation even says they were so frightened, they couldn't do anything. They were, they, they, they were. So somebody had to challenge the status quo. Somebody had to challenge the status quo. And the problem is that they were listening to the wrong voice. Who were they listening to? Goliath. Goliath's voice had become so loud, 
so loud. We are entertained by our fears. And the voice of our fears become our primary. We want to stay focused on that because we're scared the moment we take our eyes off that, we will be overcome. So we don't even take our eyes and put it on God because we're so afraid of our fears, so afraid of our adversities, of our challenges. 40 days, twice a day. How many times is that? 80 times. 80 times. Can you imagine how God felt? Get behind the scenes here with me. Get behind the scenes. God is going to, <laughs> God is going to finish the story in 30 seconds. Zip, 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 30 seconds he's going to give, finish the story. Did God know this? God knew this. But 80 days God had to watch his army who are called by his name stand there petrified, absolutely petrified with no faith in him and all his history of faithfulness and his strength and his demonstration of power through history and watch them embarrass him. Think about God. Think about the angels. The angels are like, come on, guys. You know this. This is easy. Come on, let's do this. 40 days, twice a day, morning and evening, the Philistine giant would come out for a formal declaration of the terms and conditions of this war. And he loudly berated, taunted, poked, jeered the Israelite army. And the army just got more and more. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Who says it can't be done? Who's telling you that God's purposes in your life cannot be accomplished? Who's telling you you're not the person to make it happen? Sometimes you need just a fresh voice, someone from outside, a young kid from the village with fresh eyes to come in and say, hey, who's this guy, man? Who's this? Listen to what this guy is saying. Who is this chap? My goodness, how can he talk against our God like that? Doesn't he have any idea who he's dealing with? We need a fresh voice. We need a fresh voice. So as David talked with his brothers on the front line, note, as David talked with his brothers on the front line, he saw Goliath start shouting his usual threats. So David was there at the right time, at the right place, and God made this happen to the Israel army. And when the army heard Goliath, when the army heard Goliath, one man, many men, they all ran away in terror. They ran away in terror. You need Mel Gibson to put this in a movie, man. They all ran away in terror. Here's your third giant. Disapproval. Disapproval. What's the first giant? Huh? What? Delay. Delay. Number two, discard. Number three, disapproval. His brothers questioned him. His brothers questioned him. There's a third dream buster, and we call it the giant of disapproval. He had been willing to face disapproval, and he had to be willing to face disapproval in order to go after his dream. You and I are going to have to do the same thing. Not everybody is going to go, rah, rah, yeah, man. You can. Not everybody's going to do that. Not everybody is going to stand there in the lung and with pom poms and, and cheer you on. Here's the problem the reason why most people don't even go after their dreams is that they're afraid of disapproval, they're afraid of rejection. Pelei, beforehand, they are afraid of rejection. And in this case, David's own brothers questioned his motives. We want people to like us. We want approval before we step out in faith, apparently. We want, like, we want to be liked before we could like anybody. We want some evidence that you will be my friend and then you're okay with me before I can be your friend and I'm okay with you. We live on the edge of fear and courage. We want everyone to approve of everything we do and then we step forward and we, we think that's courage to us. But if you go after God's dream for your life, 
And we're not talking about your dream. We're not talking about believe in yourself. We're not talking about you can do it, a best life now. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about God's will for your life. God's amazing design for what he wants with your 70, 80 years. What he can use you to do. The gift that he has given you to do. The calling that is upon your life. We're talking about that. So don't mix it with this nonsense from Instagram and from all your other, you know, motivational speakers and, and your general believe in yourself. You can, don't. Don't, don't mix it. David asked, let me, let me find out here. What's the reward if I kill this fellow? Let's say I kill this guy. What is the reward for killing him? And end this disgraceful abuse. Look at how he's speaking about, about my God. I will, I will shut him up right now. David. His brothers have been in the army. So he's got soldier brothers, G.I. Joes. And the G.I. Joes didn't have the guts to do that. This guy with the sling looking after sheep has got the guts to do that. So they are a little jealous right now of his courage. So what they're going to do? They're going to oppose him. They're going to disapprove of him. When David's older brother heard this, one guy, older brother, when he heard this, he burned with anger at David. Ha! Ah, how's that for encouragement? He burned with anger against David. And he said, why are you even here? Why aren't you taking care of your scrawny little flock of sheep? You cocky little brat. I know how conceited you are. Nice older brother, huh? And David, like every other younger brother said, now what have I done? Can't I even ask a question? That's your younger brother for you. Classic sibling rivalry. They think they know you. They think every, every pair, <laughs> older brother, the brothers and sisters, they think they know you. Ye kya what, is, what, what are you going to do? Remember Jesus of Nazareth? We know his brothers. We know his sisters. What are they going to do? Sad truth. Sometimes it's your own family and loved ones that come in the way of accomplishing God's dream for you. Envy, jealousy. They know your weaknesses. They know... Your shortcomings. They know what marks you got in sixth standard. They know how you struggle to get through 12. They know how you struggle to kind of uh, please mom and dad. They know you inside out. So they're like, you? You? Come on. And when you've got your own loved ones disapproving you, then you start doubting yourself. Number four is doubt. Number four is doubt. Am I capable of this? Am I up to the task? Can I actually do what God is asking me to do? So David goes to Saul, the king, and he says, don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about a thing, David told the king. I'll fight this Philistine. He goes to the king and tells him he's going to do it. I'll fight the Philistine. Don't be ridiculous, Saul says. There's no way you can go against this Philistine, you're only a boy and he's been a professional warrior all his life. That's what the king says in verse 32 to verse 33. Listen to me, L listen to me. How do you defeat the giants that are keeping you from becoming the man of God you want to be? How can you defeat those fears, those giants that are keeping you from becoming the woman of God God wants you to be? The person God wants you to, not the task he wants you to accomplish, but the person he wants you to be. Because the person comes first. To be a person of great faith, with a great dream, and a great life work. How do you overcome those giants? Number one, delay, discouragement, disapproval. The first thing you do is this. You remember how God has helped me in the past. You remember how God has helped me in the past. So verse 36 through verse 37. In protecting my sheep, David tells Saul, in protecting my sheep, I've killed a lion. I've killed a lion and I've killed a... He's not showing off. Wait, wait, watch what he says. I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. The Lord who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will surely now deliver me from this Philistine. You know the words there? The lion, the bear, this Philistine. Feel it. Feel it. 
So that's where his confidence was not in his skills. His confidence was not in what the other person had that he didn't have. His confidence was that if this is God's dream and God has the resources and God needs a man, I'll be that man. I will be that man because everything else is going to come from God. All he wants is an obedient man. All he wants is an obedient woman, an available man, an available woman. All he wants is someone who will trust him no matter what. Close his eyes and trust him. I'll be that man, David says. This man, David, King David, he he deeply encouraged and inspired me when I was a younger man. When I was a young boy, when I was 14, 15 years old, and I studied through the Psalms, and I studied through Samuel, and I understood David because he's one of my favorite characters. David was one of my favorite characters. I studied him because he had a heart after God. He was called a man who had a heart after God's own heart, et cetera, et cetera. And he, and he, and he had these weaknesses. He had this show-offy kind of moments, but he also just was able to trust God with ridiculous things. And he... There was no focus on what he could do. There was only focus, you, 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 my God. Have you met my God? Have you, have you met my God? You have no idea what I can accomplish because you haven't met my God. And when my God comes through and you see what God does through me, you will meet my God. And you will also want my God to become? That hit me when I was 17 years old. And I've never recovered from that. I've never recovered from that. I understood that faith is not believing in yourself. Faith is believing that God is telling me the truth and that his voice needs to be the loudest. So the first thing you remember, starting today, 1st of October, 2023, the first thing you remember is God has helped me in the past. God has gotten you through in the past. God has helped people who have trusted in him in the past. And because God never changes, number two, you use the tools God has given to you right now. You use the tools God has given to you right now. I don't want to wait for something that I'll have in the future. I don't have money right now, so I can't accomplish God's will. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough connections. I don't have enough influence. I don't have enough opportunities. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm not this. I don't have that. When I get all of that, I will do great things for God. Come in yoga. If you're not doing it now, if you're not ready now, if you're not available now, you never will be. Number two, use the tools God has given you right now. So David goes to Saul and Saul finally gets, buys into the whole story. He says, okay, 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 fine. We'll give it a shot. Worst thing that we do, you'll die. So, okay, let's do this. You wear my armor. So Saul's also a tall guy. Remember when he got chosen? He was a head taller than everybody else. Now his armor would have been made for his size. Okay? So his armor is now on David, who's a small fellow. He's a young guy. So David is lost in the armor. He can't even find himself. And he's like, I can't do this. This is not my weapon of choice. This is not my security. My security is not in this. I'm not comfortable with this. I need to go out with what I'm comfortable with what I have been using, what God has put in my hand. And what has God put in my hand? I can do this. I can use this. You got to understand, it's not about the enemy. It's not about the weapon. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But we will trust in God, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Then Saul dressed David in his own armor, but David said, I cannot go out with these because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Instead, he chose five stones. He didn't even need all the five stones. How many did he use? One. Because you need to be honing your skill while you're waiting for God to use you. I repeat, you need to be honing your skill while you're waiting for God to use you. You need to be good at what God has given you so that God can give you more. You need to be accurate at what God has given you as a target before you can be promoted to something greater. 
five smooth stones. Now you need smooth stones because they have to sit in the, in the, in the pack over there. They have to sit in the leather pack there, in the leather bag. And as you let it go, the smoothness of the stones will work with the aerodynamics principle and fly through the air. You can't just pick any stone. You've got to have bullets. You've got to have bullets. It's down to even that logistic. Smooth stones. Often people will give you their methods, their armor, their familiar ways of coping. They will burden you unnecessarily with the ways they face their challenge in their own faith life. You've got to find your own. You've got to work with what God has given to you. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. So we're ending our 50 days of transformation. And this is the start of a new dream. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. This is the day to start the dream. This is the day to go after it. When there is discouragement, when there's doubt, are you going to trust God? When there's delay, when people hold you back, when people disapprove, you're just going to have to say, sorry, I got to do what I got to do. God has called me to do that. Number three, you ignore the dream busters. You ignore the giants, the dream busters. He's taking on a problem that everyone else is scared to deal with, yet everybody's got an opinion of how he should do it. You got that? <laughs> you got that? None of them wanted to do it, but the moment you want to do it, everyone has an idea. He got no encouragement from anyone, not a single person, family, army, king, no one. When you're going after a God-sized dream for your life, you can't go to career development or career guidance people. You can't just go to uncles and aunties and grandfathers. You've got to go back to God, the, the dream designer, the dream designer of your life. You're going to face delays. You're going to face discouragement. You're going to face disapproval. You've got to be ready for that. Here's what David did. When others were speaking against him, when others were speaking against him, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Stare at that verse for a second. This may be the best verse for the coming year. When others were speaking against him, David encouraged himself in the Lord. My brother and sister, you have to anchor down, drop your anchor in God. Drop your anchor into the person, the depth, the manifold wisdom of God. For yourself, your own anchor. Find your own footing, find your own grounding. In God alone, just you and Him. Because there will be moments when you will have to stand alone. There will be moments when nobody will understand what you're called to do. It's just you and God and some Philistine Goliath. When you get there, God is all you need. God is all you need. Number four, what did David do? He expected God to help him for his glory. He expected God to help him for his glory. David shouted at Goliath. I love this. Who's been shouting twice a day for 40 days? Goliath. So David, so you can shout. I can also shout. So David shouted. Small fellow. He shouted at Goliath. Everybody stopped. Okay. The movie director said, cut. What did this guy just say? David shouted to Goliath, you come at, oh, I love this. You come at me with sword and spear and javelin. I come at you in a name. I come at you in a name. I come at you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Once you learn your secret code, once you learn the secret code to your to your weapon of mass destruction, you will understand it's a name. And God has given you a name, Jehovah Nissi, he's your banner. Today the Lord will conquer you, David is informing Goliath, just so that he knows in advance. Today the Lord will conquer you and the whole world will know that there is a God. And everyone will know that the Lord doesn't need weapons to rescue his people. It is his battle, not ours. The Lord will give you to us. Yeah. 
the Lord will give you to me. What are you expecting God to do in your life? Without even knowing you, I can tell you, God is doing exactly what you expect him to do. Right now, 2023, God is doing only and only exactly what you expect him to do. Because God works in accordance with your faith. No more, no less. Every time God moves out of heaven, moves on earth and does a miracle, it's because somebody believed. The Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says, whatever is not of faith is sin. It's sin. When you act in faith, sometimes you just have to stand still and let God move. When you stand still and let God move. Some of the greatest moments of faith is when you stop arguing, stop fighting, stop and stand still and let God move. It's based on how much you want to trust him. Let's conclude today's message and let's conclude 50 days of transformation. Let's conclude the transformed series. You have no idea how much your unbelief could be limiting somebody you love. Is your unbelief limiting your wife? Is your unbelief limiting your husband? Is your unbelief limiting your son or your daughter or your brother or your friend? Somebody is wanting to trust God for greater things for their life. And you're like, nah, there isn't yoga. There isn't yoga. No, there isn't yoga, but he is trusting God. Don't be a Jesse. Don't hold them back when God has a great dream for their life. It's not your dream for them. It's God's dream for them. And you need to say, I'm not going to let anybody else their unbelief hold me back. I'm not going to hold anybody else back. I'm going to trust in God. God will give you into my hands. Is there something you want to say to God right now? Is there something you want to respond? With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just take a moment to bring 50 days to an end to bring the transform series to an end. In all of these seven messages, something must have hit you. Something must have challenged you. Something must have said, I want to change the way I think, change the way I do things in my life. Make a commitment. Have a plan. Remember the four Ds and get ready to walk in faith, to move out in the name of God, the name of Christ. Heavenly Father, we need perspective and we need faith. We need perspective and we need faith. Our perspective is skewed because we're listening to wrong voices. The voices are too loud in our head. And we need to learn how to switch them off. We need faith because we need to know what you're capable of. We need to remember what you have done for us in the past. We need to remember who you have been to us in the past and how you have been faithful. We need to remember that our weapons are not made of hands, our weapons are, is a name, is a name we call on faith and prayer. That our life is not led by our strengths, it's led by a name. We call ourselves Christian, Christ first, me in Christ. Oh God, do a deep work in my life. Change the way I think, change the way I feel about how I see my problems, my giants. Because at the end of the day, you will take down every giant. But what will be my role in that? What will be my testimony? Who will tell my story as a story of faith? Thank you for being with us through the Transform series. This was meant for your colleagues, your unchurched friends and your loved ones. Pass it on to them so that they can be introduced to the transforming power of Christ. Next week. Mark, the son of man, the series I was doing earlier. We're going to continue that. Going through the gospel of Mark, following Jesus around, watching him deal with people, relationships. So please come back next week. Bring a friend, bring your Bibles, and let's dive deep into his word and enjoy our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Hi, I'm Jeremy Dawson, and if you liked what you just saw, if it was a blessing, then hit the subscribe button. Come on, you can do it. Hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell so that we know you want to hear from us. Lots of videos coming your way, songs, worship, encouragement. Come on, subscribe. Let's take this forward and share with somebody you might know. Write a comment in the section below, but let's see you guys again. Come on, subscribe.